This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today, we've packed a number of shows together to give you some highlights. I know you're going to enjoy the show. Thank you for being with us today. Today, our guest is Dan French. Nearly 20 years of experience in transacting and operating real estate. He's managing director of ATX Acquisitions and CEO at ResProp Management. Uh, two billion plus uh, in AUM with a history of operating uh, 15,000 apartment units. I uh, sold 80 plus properties, returning nearly $1 billion to investors and partners uh, just recently. Uh, and so it just, man, this guy's got a ton of experience. Uh, they have a team that's uh, just they have a lot of great experience. They've done some great things over, over the last uh, 15 to 20 years uh, and, and really pl plan the market well, which you will hear about. But you're going to spend some time with Dan over the next uh, two days, and he's going to do a series with us and dive into, I mean, he, uh, a number of things that I wish I had known, you know, years ago, right? Uh, and I, he just was very transparent, even some challenging times that he shared about, uh, you know, through the first part of their business, right? But the lessons learned were so valuable, right? And you're going to hear that today from Dan. Dan, welcome to the show. I'm looking forward to diving in on a number of topics that I know you are an expert in. And just so the listeners know, we're going to do a series of shows with Dan. And so we can have more time to talk in depth about a few things that I know that you're going to want to hear about. Uh, Dan, give us a little bit about your background, getting into commercial real estate. What does that look like? Maybe even a couple, couple of things for you that were like crucial in your success. Whitney, I appreciate you having me on. It's um it's a pleasure, and I uh, hope to add some value to your audience here uh, today. And uh, I, I do want to say I'm, I'm a fan of the show. I'm also a big fan of your mission. It's very inspiring to me, actually, that you're putting uh, some of your personal profits back into something you believe in, which is helping uh, folks adopt uh, when they're having some troubles there. So that that rings very um, true to me as people in my life have, have had some similar troubles. So I appreciate what you do there. Appreciate that. Good. But my my journey in real estate really began um, actually when I was about 25 years old. And it was fun to get started. Uh, I, I, I've been with the same business partner. His name is Pete Rex. Great guy, great friend. Um, someone I grew up with from the time I was seven years old. And myself uh, and his brother and, and Pete went into real estate investing. And, and that's that's how we got started, buying really small deals. And before you know it, we had a bunch of them. And this is about 05, 2005. So uh, to put that into context, totally different world, different environment. Um, for any folks that have been investing <laughs> that long, you might recall some of this stuff. But, but you know, we, we were uh, kind of working class background, trying to rise up and create hopefully some value in the world. I, I always thought it would be a long-term investment and long-term payout. And I was willing to, to kind of delay the marshmallows and, and make it happen. But uh, I didn't know it would be so active. And so, so really, for a couple of years from 05 to 07, we kind of felt like we were on top of the world and we're, we're you know, <laughs> our unit count, although small by today's measure, seemed very high to me at least. And, and I was really, um, I was pumped up and, and I thought we were off to the races. And of course, looking back, we did a lot of things wrong. Uh, you know, we were over leveraged. We didn't have um, sufficient capital reserves. We didn't have a lot of operating knowledge. And so when the tough times came in, late 07 and 2008, we were one of the first groups, you know, if you can call it a group, we were a small partnership, uh, you know, we were in trouble really fast. So now um, we, we spent many years battling through all of that uh, from 08 to 2011. And um, we avoided the worst of, of it. But but it was a trying time. And it really, um, it, it challenged our friendship, it challenged our partnership, the whole thing almost went up in smoke, you know, it was very, very stressful. So that's my background, and maybe I'll pause there. Um, that's how I got started, let's say. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention there. Uh, obviously, your your partnership uh, is it Peter? Did you say um, Peter Rex? Yeah. You no. Know, how did how did you all meet again, and and what did that look like to say? You know what? I, I get questions all the time about partnerships, yeah. uh, and, and I talk about it often about my partnership and how I was I was asked to be part partners with lots of people and said no you know, because I just didn't feel it was a good fit. Right. Uh, and then, man, when I found my partner now, I'm a business partner. I, I, I just knew, I knew we had complementary skill sets. We had so much in common. Uh, you know, there was, it was just different. Right. Uh, I, yeah, I yeah. knew that it was a good fit uh, and even did a lot of things to 
kind of test the waters before we permanently said we're going to partner, you know? So anyway, I've talked about that often on the show uh, and, and, but we'd love to hear how you knew that Peter, you know, was going to be a good partner, or maybe you said you all knew each other beforehand and some of that. Um, but talk through that just, just briefly at least, uh, cause I know the listeners, there are some of them are looking for partners as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm very happy to go into this and, and maybe provide some value to your, to your audience. I would say number one, um, as a piece of advice, you know, go, you know, make sure what you're saying is, is, is really going to happen before you dive in with someone, make sure you know a lot about them and, and maybe test it out, right. Their, their character, how they handle uh, pressure. Um, Cause when good, when the times are good, everything's easy. You know, it's, it's when times get challenging that you, you really find out who's made of the right stuff, you know? So, so getting back to how I met, Pete and, and everything like that. I was born in the in the New York City, you know, in the Bronx in New York City. My family, when I was seven years old, this is the 80s, they they kind of moved up to the, the suburban area of, of the New York City metropolitan area um, to, you know, do the American dream thing, provide better opportunities for me. And I was lucky enough to meet Pete and his brother Rob as soon as I moved up there um, through sports and uh, through Catholic education and stuff like this. Um, so we just became super tight as kind of family units is uh, getting to know each other. And that persisted over time, even though I went to separate high school, separate college uh, as Pete. But getting out of my undergrad, I felt something very that that I believe is very durable in, in you know across the globe, which is you know getting access to real estate investments um, or buying real estate is a is like a tried and true way to rise up, create value, create wealth for yourself. Or maybe if you have investors, um, same thing. So when Pete, Pete was the one that actually approached me with this idea to go into real estate. And the reason why I said yes, basically immediately, and Pete and his brother Rob, was because number one, integrity. I thought that was that was a key thing. Uh, so these are people that I know, good times, bad times, they're going to do the right thing. If, if the lights are on or no one's looking, it doesn't matter. It's the same thing. They're going to be terrific people. Um, that I would I would trust with my, you know, with everything. So that was number one, trust and integrity. Number two was drive. Yeah, I just knew Pete from the time I had ever met him was so driven, um, so on the ball, uh, really wanted to make a difference, kind of light the world on fire, this type. So to me, that those are two um, very key ingredients to a partnership uh, to, or to a potential partner. Yeah, yeah, and that's incredible. There's some great advice there. Uh, and a couple of things I wanted to reiterate that you said, because I, I thought it was really good. Uh, you know, it's like, have have they been under pressure? And, mm. and, and, I, and I, maybe I'm adding a little bit here, but have they been under pressure and performed before? Uh, and, and has their character been tested? You know, like in some way, is there a way for you to see that or know that? And it seems like you knew the, you know, you knew enough about Peter and his brother to know these things. So it sounds like there was already a very high level of trust there. And you knew they were driven and probably because of, the history with them, right? Or things you already, you know, so, uh, anyway, I think it's great advice. Uh, and, and, uh, it's, it's really good. Uh, another thing I wanted to hit on, um, you know, the 2008, you said, uh, you know, uh, there's three things and, and correct me if I didn't get these correct, but you said low, re low reserves, uh, over leveraged and ultimately little knowledge or experience, right. Uh, right, by yeah. that time. Uh, and, and I just wonder too, cause I, obviously where we're at now, you know, in this market cycle and what's had some of the things that are happening, you know, how is that different now? Uh, so I, I just say it's so important, uh, especially for you all that that were th went through that. H how do you look at deals differently now? Or what is the reserves or leverage, you know, look like now on deals compared to maybe what you were doing then? Or, or did that change? Or what does that look like? So you all aren't in that same predicament again? You know, the key thing I think is, is the downside protection, just really understanding that that real estate is a financial asset. And so much of, of the value of the asset is driven by the debt that you can you know place on on, on the the asset. And when you when you're downside protected, you know, like today, um, you know, loan to loan to value, loan to cost, or it's it's in the 60s and or 55 percent. So you're coming in with a lot of equity. So that that already is like uh, forcing downside protection. Now, even a year and a half ago, uh, I think some groups were, were levering up to the 80s. Um, and so that's not even, I don't even think that's really truly as possible today. Maybe if you have some, some strange, uh, debt partners that want to 
go in and do that with you. But you know that downside protection, having uh, a lot of equity in your deal, having long-term debt as well, these are critical. So we didn't. I think we had floating on on some of that stuff back in the day. Yeah, downside protection is number one, and that includes having capital reserves for something that goes wrong. You know, these are small deals, four unit buildings, but if a roof breaks, guess what? You might not be able to handle that with your rent payments and the the income and cash flow. Shifting from that, just choosing really a good location, a location that you want to bet on for 10 years, because you might own some of these deals for 10 years. You know, that's how we try to look at things. We, we like we like to be long-term hold um, as our default. And if we happen to, you know, go out of a deal Sooner than that, then that's rare uh, in our world. But but yeah, we we want to bet on a long term location that's going to be durable with population growth, economic growth, and we didn't choose that correctly our first time around from 05 to 08. Uh, I think we got it right by 2010 or 11, 12. So yeah, there's something about how those challenging times shape us, right? Uh, yeah, because I, I think it's related to this conversation as well. Uh, but just thinking through, you know, I mean, you all bought a lot of assets now. You all have grown a lot, right? Uh, you know, over the last number of years. I mean, you just mentioned, you know, what, 17,000 units, uh, you know, mm-hmm. in the last, I don't know, was it six or eight years or something like that? Uh, yeah, 2011 but, to 19, thereabouts. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that's that means you have a great team around you, right? <laughs> yeah, you didn't do all of that, I, I would imagine, right? <laughs> so, yeah, right. So Absolutely you know, you, yeah. you you all built a great team, uh, and so uh, share about that a little bit. You know, I mean, what it took for you all to build uh, just a, a, an A class team, right? You know, or A players surrounding yourself with A players. How have you all done that so well? So that that business is, is um, something that you know, right now, when as we're buying assets, that's a new business that we're buying the assets uh, currently because it's a, it's a new market, it's a new. It's a new investment thesis. It's really right now as our current firm is called ATX Acquisitions. And I can go into that later if that's helpful. But but the firm that we are talking about that bought um, you know, two billion in assets was a vertically integrated shop. So I think it's important to mention, you know, what kind of sponsor are you? You know, are you are you a sponsor that's going to be vertically integrated, like we were, you know, or are you a sponsor that is going to look to have your property management, construction management? maybe even asset management kind of outsourced, right? You're going to have third-party folks doing this and you'll hire them and then oversee them. So we decided to build that platform in a vertically integrated way. And the reason why um, we did that was because we knew coming out of the great financial crisis, uh, again, this is like ancient history to some folks, but um, you know, coming out of that great financial crisis, we were going to buy some heavily distressed, physically distressed deals. Right. Especially in Florida. Um, Florida at that point was like left for dead. People forget about this. But um, but a lot of the buildings were completely zero percent occupied. They were they were just left. You know, the banks had taken back a lot of the keys, didn't know how to run the deals. Mm. So the banks had these deals on their balance sheet and they would, you know, seek to offload them to groups like ours. So so Pete, um, as a founder and chairman, thought you know what, this is going to be a, a very specific play. We're going to have to go do turnarounds, heavy turnarounds, and have an entrepreneurial team do that. And we felt that was best done with an in-house team because you can get a lot more scrappy if you kind of set the tone as as your own team rather than hiring somebody from, you know, that's not as, as invested in, in the turnaround of your asset. So we felt like that was the most important thing. If we're going to do these heavy value add deals and bet on the future of Florida, bet on the future of Texas coming back from the great financial crisis, we felt that that was important. So let me just set the table there. And then is that helpful? And then I Yeah, can that is helpful. You all made a good bet there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a great, it was a great bet. And, and you know, a lot of execution now behind it. So that's where we right. can talk about an A team um, because no, certainly, uh, you know, if it, if I was alone or Pete was alone, absolutely not. You know, you can't you can't do seventeen thousand uh, apartments and doing well with a with a really strong track record um, during all that time without having an A team. So so credit to to Pete in large part. You know he he had a vision to have a sustainable platform and and the way we we came together was I, I think we we kind of just chopped up different capabilities and we would go hire people that were super hungry 
and very uh, capable and, and ambitious to have a, you know, an impact on the world. And so um, I think A teams start with character and that includes a mission orientation. So they have to be like mission focused if they're gonna work with us um, because we do try to attach a mission to all the work that we do. Even if it's seemingly mundane, we wanna have people that are driven to empower others. And, and back, in, back then there was um, a big mission to provide people great homes. When, when the whole great financial crisis is happening, people, they're being completely underserved. It was really sad, some of these places that people were habitating. Um, and we brought them back to life. You know, So that was a very, very powerful mission, and it, and it really animated a lot of our team. So that's going to attract the right type out of the gate, right? the right character, the people that are going to be like, all right, cool, I want to get in on board with that mission. And of course, yeah, the mission as well of stewarding other people's capital. You know, these are folks that are, that we exec level people, partner level people that knew uh, it's, a, it's a huge financial uh, responsibility and really actually an even moral obligation when you're accepting other folks' capital that you have to go above and beyond. And it doesn't matter if you're tired or things went wrong or whatever, you know, you have a mission to steward that capital well. So it just starts with it, with character. Maybe give a couple of tips, even on uh, hiring. Uh, you know, how you all have hired some of your top people on how you've, you found them for one, but then how do you, how do you know their character? Uh, you know, when you're going through that process, uh, there's definitely been times I've hired people where I thought that they were going to be a good fit and it, it didn't turn out <laughs> the way yeah, I expected. Yeah. Right. Uh, but then again, there's been some that have, uh, that have gone way and above what I even expected, you know, as well. Uh, you know, uh, right. Uh, and so, yeah, any right. tips on how you found them and how, and maybe how you thought through their character, how you knew that about them to hire them, uh, and then we'll have to move uh, move to another topic. Yeah, so, no, thanks, Whitney. And that, that resonates with me for sure. Like, you know, the one thing for your, for the audience is you're not going to get it right um, every single time. You know, you're going right. to, you can hopefully you fail forward to get closer to the next person that's going to be like your stable, high character you know, high integrity, high drive, high talent person. Um, but but I think it's a mix of things. Like we, uh, some of them were personal relationships that that Pete had. Some of them were, you know, a, a recruiter. Um, one of our partners came from a recruiter. That was random, um, but turned out to be, he was like a 10, 10 or 11 year partner with us and, and still is on that, on that former business. Yeah, and, you know, some of it's just hustle, outreach. Um, we noticed our, our, uh, CFO now, Rachel Ridley, was moving from the Virgin Islands into Tampa, and, and someone on our team hit her up. She's still with us for 11 years um, and, and going into this next business with us as well. So I think it's, just a, it's, it's a combination of just like hustle, network, putting yourself out there, um, and then having a good vetting process, which I don't know how much time I want to spend on that, but we have a very strong vetting process. We like to sometimes um, work with folks before we hire them full time, have them have like a little consulting period um, that you, like a try before you buy kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sounds transactional, but but it's super helpful because you don't that folk, that person doesn't want to waste their time either. And the worst thing you can do is waste people's time in their career by by hiring them wrong. I love that thought process of of having the consulting time. I think that's very valuable for the listener to think about. Uh, we have recently done that with someone, uh, and and uh, and I, it's an obvious hire for us. Uh, but uh, you know, it's been helpful just to have that time, though. You know, to kind of test the waters a little bit, right? Uh, before you're, uh, you have to, you know, they commit to you, and and, and like you said, you're not wasting their time. Um, but uh, that's some great advice. Uh, you know, what would you say are, are some of the most important things to focus on? Uh, you know, when you know you're all building. Uh, you know, your business very successfully building, I think, another brand now, it sounds like. But what would yeah. you say, you know, for the listener who's who's building a business, and, you know, what's like some of the most important things they should be focused on? I think team is number one. And, you know, if we can kind of sticking with this a little bit, like a, an A player, you know, what is an A player? To, so to me, an A player is that if you look at um, for that person's level across the industry that you're in, they are top 10% or, or top 15%. So a B player is top 50%. Um, and a C player is below average, below the 50%. So you really want to stay away from the C. But the A player is going to move your whole business forward. And it's going to allow you to free up to, to focus on what you actually do best. Because otherwise, you're going to be doing everyone else's work as the leader. 
because you can't let the thing, you can't let the ship go down. So at the end of the day, you're going to be doing it. You might be up till 2 a.m. every night if you have the wrong team. So you have to just start with like, it's like first who and, and then what, you know, first who's on the bus. I think that's good to create by Jim Collins. He's the one that said that like first who and then what. I think I think that's really critical. And we spend a lot of time thinking about that. We don't always get it right, obviously. So, yeah, the team is so important that people are preparing to be able to buy deals like that. Uh, can you elaborate on the type of fund a little bit or or uh, or maybe on the past investor side, what does this fund look like, uh, you know, when, when you're sharing it with an investor? What do they expect? Yeah, so it's a it's a general partner fund. And uh, so we uh, all the partners have money that we have alongside of our partners that come into the fund. And, and so anyone that, that wants to invest with our team would have two different options, really. Right? You can go deal by deal. If you want to be a little bit more active, you can choose a deal. And we'll show uh, any deal that we have under control. We'll show that to our, our capital partner network. They can be active and say, hey, I love the deal in Austin, but I don't really love that deal in Jacksonville. Um, or you can go in the fund, and that means you're going to get a diversified portfolio of assets, and you're um, you're going to be a little bit more passive, right? You're, you're going to say, I trust you to steward this capital. I trust you're going to find great deals, and you're going to get diversified across at least you know two different states, Texas and Florida, which we're primarily betting on. Although we'll look at some other states, and this time around we're more uh, asset class agnostic. So we're looking um, not basically anything except for traditional office. We're going to stay far away from that. But besides that, we're, we have um, opened up the funnel quite a bit. Um, like I said, we have already bought a, a hospitality deal, hotel. We're looking at triple net deals when they come around. We're looking at industrial possibly medical office, but basically that's how it goes, right? The, the GP fund is asset class agnostic. It's betting on this interest rate, um, the shocks caused by the interest rate environment, and it's going to be diversified. And that's how we'll put, we'll put that together. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, and it's interesting why, so have you all uh, been strictly multifamily focused in the past or up to this point? Primarily, yeah, we, we just bought a couple you know, one-off kind of offices is for our own use, but but primarily it's been multifamily focused um, from from a hard asset standpoint. Now Pete has some track record investing in some other things, but yeah, from a hard physical asset, it's been multifamily primarily. Speak to the decision or thought to open up to even other asset classes now, and and just the you know being able to manage them as well, and and yeah, take on a new venture like that. Yeah, something we debated heavily, you know, because we do have strong network and strong track record. And, and you know, we, we are still obviously looking at multifamily because people, now that they've heard we're active, they're, they're showing us deals. And that's been great, especially off-market deals. And we love that. But yeah, we, we just feel like this is a different time frame. You know, the, when we were getting started in 20, getting restarted, I guess you'd say, from, from my standpoint, but 2011, 12, 13, that was a specific period, a specific bet or trade uh, in the market. And now this is something different. And we're betting more on lo location than specific asset class. So location being, we feel like there's a durable trend that's going to continue of people moving out of the high regulatory, high tax states. It's going to continue to go um, uh, to Florida and Texas. Also, if you look at the Mexican growth story, Texas is a great derivative of that play. You know, a lot of manufacturing is coming from, is going to get uh, reshored, if you want, if you will, back to North America after COVID with the supply chain stuff. And that's going to continue to rage forward. Mexico is the 10th largest economy in the world. A lot of people don't even think about that, but we feel like that's going to keep growing. And just so many different drivers. So really, we're just looking for jewel assets in great locations that are Downside protected, strong cash flow, and that's why we're more open um, yeah. because multifamily might the the pricing dislocation is not is not fully realized yet, and we can talk about that where there's a a, a spread between what buyers are looking to pay and what sellers are willing to accept. Yeah, go ahead and speak to that. I think that's valuable to think through that. Yeah, they you know a lot of people in the industry are, are they'll call it like a bid ask spread, right? Where where um, you know a seller is is hanging on, I think, to the past a little bit too much, 
and they're not they're not accepting that um, simply just by interest rates going up so much that a new buyer cannot pay the same price that they were ex expecting. Maybe they flirted with with taking out their deal to, uh, to the market in 2022. They probably should have sold then, right? When right before interest rates went crazy, um, and so they're holding on to that old pricing that they that they heard about. And they're holding out for dear life and, and just saying, hey, maybe it'll get better. Maybe it'll get better. I don't want to sell for 30% less than what you know I, I could have gotten just 18 months ago. And the buyer, though, is, is constricted because they have to underwrite to new insurance costs. They have to underwrite to new debt. They have to underwrite to new labor costs, you know, wages of, of their on-site team. Um, so, so that spread is still there where the buyers are going to be capped or responsible buyers at least are going to be capped at what they can pay and the sellers are going to try to hold on until they get you know really forced into a sale so so right now i think we're seeing a lot of this kind of spread be continuing and we see it all the time because we have a very active pipeline and, and it's hard to put together a deal that is downside protected yeah just gotta stay, stay patient it's a hard reality, right? Uh, it's a uh, it's hard to bring yourself mentally to the point where you really believe, okay, I've got to get rid of this asset, and it's it may be you know many millions less than what you heard, like you said, quote, you know, right? You heard that it may be worth two years ago, right, or twelve months, you know, whatever it was, um, and so that's that's hard, right? It's it is, uh, but uh, it better better now than being made to sell maybe six months from now, right? Uh, at times too. Uh, so that, uh, yeah, it, it is difficult. Uh, no doubt about it. I, I agree with you though, that I, I believe over the next 12 months, there'll be many fire sales or there'll be many, you know, operators that it's so unfortunate, right. But they didn't protect their downside. Uh, like you talked about yesterday, they did similar things, maybe even worse, probably worse, right. Than than what you all had done, you know, say in 08 or before, right. Uh, yeah. and, and are even less prepared or way over leveraged or less reserves or, where I uh, didn't raise enough money, all those things that they just left no, there's no no margin there, right, for error uh, exactly. whatsoever. Um, and there's, it's real estate, there's error, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there's going to be things you don't expect uh, to say, to say the least. Um, so, so that's your all's, uh, say, would you say that's a big, your main focus right now is raising this fund. So an expectation of, of these deals that, that unfortunately are going to go back to the banks. Exactly. Yeah. Just, just to be prepared to have the dry powder. And we've already closed one deal um, in, in this fund. And we have, we're, we're in the best and final on another deal that we expect to uh, hopefully control in the next couple of days here. So we're, you know, like I said, we're active. We're, we're both patient. So yeah. that's a good thing is that, um, and, and that, that kind of goes hand in hand. You have to, uh, be very active and then you might have to look at way more deals than you did in the past, but that's okay. You know, yeah. that you can really um, gain conviction on the right one. Is that, uh, are you buying those? I mean, are they still owned by the seller or are they owned by the lender or come back to the lender? How, no, where those well, coming from? Yeah. Well, one was uh, both still owned by the seller. So no, no bank owned transactions yet, but the, the one we did so far had seller financing that we had, well, negotiated with the seller. So that was very helpful. Um, so we got 4% uh, seller financing over five years with interest. Nice. On. So I made the deal work. You know, that was a, that's downside protection. Yeah. You know, and that, that was a great thing. I, I'd love to do 50 more of those, but those are <laughs> this those year, are right? Yeah, yeah, right now. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're hard to come by, but, but that's, that, that's kind of the alpha that we were hoping to bring. Uh, as a sponsor is that we have networks and we're trying to, you know, be so selective and work with different groups to make deals work in a downside protected way. Yeah. Uh, any other, uh, before we move to a few final questions, Dan, any other market trends that, that you're very focused on, or maybe that you watch, you know, very frequently? Well, you know, for multifamily, I think, I think a lot of folks are talking about this, but, but make, make sure as a listener, you really look at supply. Um, that's, that's huge. I know your group, um does this Whitney very well but but you know make sure you're in a market where you in a sub market where you understand what is the supply coming online because so many uh with the low interest rate environment during that period so many shovels went to the ground because it was easier to get construction debt so you have this massive run up in supply now of course we think and we know we've already seen this in the, in the data 
uh, that now with the high interest rate environment, the these deals are not going to get greenlit. So you're going to have a, a fallow period of a couple of years where groups don't make starts and put shovels in the ground. So if you can kind of like what people are saying, survive till 25, and that's when some of the supply will taper off, you'll get this period of, of um, time where there's not as much new stuff coming online. You'll have a little bit more pricing power if you're renting multifamily units. But you have to, it's so sub-market specific that you have to really dial in and do your homework. So that that's what I would say. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing so much time with us and even recording two segments with us uh, at, you know, over over two days. And so grateful for the just you being willing to be transparent, share from your time, even the hard times, right? The challenging times mm-hmm. that were probably the most educational, right? That I'm hoping the listeners and myself, you know, can learn from and not have to learn the hard way, right? Uh, but hopefully they'll take those things uh, and run with the, the advice that you gave in so many aspects. And, and even even today, talking through and what you all are doing to prepare for what you see coming, right? Uh, and so just grateful for that. Dan, again, how can the listeners get in touch with you and learn more about you? Sure. Yeah, no, it's my pleasure to be on and uh, I really appreciated it. So uh, my cell phone is 845-629-1808. Feel free to reach out to me there. But uh, Daniel French on LinkedIn atxacquisitions.com so dfrench at atxacquisitions.com thank you for being with us again today i hope that you have learned a lot from the show don't forget to like and subscribe i hope you're telling your friends about the real estate syndication show and how they can also build wealth in real estate you can also go to lifebridgecapital.com and start investing today 